I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, under God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Thank you. Welcome to our uh, December 18th meeting. This is our last. Uh, please note the council's in full attendance. Uh, this is our last meeting of the year, as far as I know. Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> so before I, uh, well, we'll go into items from council. I want to do want to say Merry Christmas to everyone. Uh, Merry Christmas. I, I, it snuck up on me. I did. It's next week. Mm. How did that happen? I don't know. I, uh, <coughs> there's a couple of things. Uh, under items of council, I would like to bring up, if I may. I know, Miss Solis, you have one thing. Can I go, we go ahead and do the others first, and then we'll, mm -hmm. okay. Um, I wanted to ask about the library amnesty, how that's working out, that we just started, which is the program for the folks who have late overdue items of extreme duration. Yes, that's correct. We are going to be starting our amnesty period on January 2nd through January 31st. Promotions on that are going to go out this week, so you'll be seeing it on the <coughs> Facebook page and um, in other, hopefully we'll get it in the newspaper. Um, if you have any questions about the amnesty period, what qualifies for amnesty, give us a call, 485-3301, um, or you can email us through our website at victoriapubliclibrary.org. Um, Dana, is it possible, like if I had a fee that I was a little worried is 40, 50 bucks and that was really hard for me. What what does this program do for that person or how does that work? With if it's fines, then they need to just call us or stop by the library and let us know and we'll look into it and double check and make sure that they do qualify for removal. Okay. And fines, all of those should be removable. When we're talking about lost materials, materials that have not been returned, we would like to see those materials returned back to us and then all of those fees can be removed on those returned materials. Okay. So it's best to call us and really ask those specific questions about their situation. And it's just going to happen in January. For just now. in January. Okay. Very good. Well, I hope people take advantage of that. Thank you. Dana, before you go, can I ask her a question? <clears throat> uh, can you just let the public know what days you're going to be open during the holidays since the kids are going to be out of school? <laughs> yes. Okay. And that's why one reason we decided to wait until after the holidays to start amnesty so we will be fully open in January. <clears throat> but we are closed. We close at 530 on December the 21st, which is this Friday. We are closed on Saturday and Sunday and Monday and Tuesday. So we open back up on Wednesday, December 26th at 9 o'clock. So it would be 9 to 8 on that day, regular schedule. We do close at 5.30 on uh, New, Year's? New Year's Eve, okay. yes, okay. and close New Year's Day. OK. <clears throat> Very good, thank you. I did forget to mention, probably should have done first, why we have council members wearing the same shirt. Um, <laughs> and I have mine on. It's underneath. Okay, I showed everybody earlier, so I am wearing it. Well, it is to support one of our employees, our fellow, what I call a fellow employee. I kind of think of us as employees as well, who's going through a medical condition right now. And uh, we're showing support for that person. Uh, did y'all, did you want to comment, Andrew? I know you kind of um, look you like you did. I just, I just want to tell David Ann and the kids that we're thinking of you. Uh, we're praying for you. And uh, you've got this. Uh, it's a show of support from up here. Um, and I appreciate all of council doing it as well. We're, uh, we're um, again, we're, we're thinking and praying for you. And, you know, with, uh, if I can add to that, we have over 600 employees. And, and uh, I think this would, that is true for all of them. Yep. You know, we chose to do this at this time. And, but we either work in the library or uh, water department or you wear a uniform, it doesn't matter. I think we all support all our employees. With that many, you know, they have a lot of them that go through different issues just as we do. So I hope they know that. I think they do. I do. Okay. Well said. Good. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, there's, we're going about to drain the duck pond. Is that true, Colby? I want people to know what you're doing down there. Um, 
Thank you, Mayor. Just uh, an update. We're going to start a project on uh, draining the duck pond and dredging the front pond out and rebuilding sidewalks and the bridge over to the gazebo. And so that project will start. Um, we've already started draining some of the du the water out to, and filling up the ponds into the golf course. But that uh, that project will take about a month or so, and, and they'll get started right after uh, Christmas uh, as far as in construction on that project. So um, hopefully no rain will be coming. And so. Okay, so people won't have access to it. You got it all fenced off. Yes, sir. Kind we'll of. have construction fencing around it, and there may be a few days if we're pumping uh, water that we have to block where we, you know, you won't have full access all the way through. But we'll we'll keep that uh, updated on social media on on what what may be closed or what may not be. Okay. What are the dates of the fish sale? <laughs> <laughs> are we going to feed the ducks since people can't bring their bread and feed them <laughs> yeah, they, they get plenty of food <laughs> <laughs> i think there's mostly turtles in there from my experience but but you find some big fish okay thank you um and then a reminder our next meeting will be Jan we moved it to January 3rd, which is a Thursday. Don't forget that. That's a little unusual for us. Did anyone else have anything before we talk about Ms. Lee? I do. Yes, sir. Uh, concerning the streets, uh, I wonder if we can get a couple of uh, uh, some information from Donald Reesrills in the near future, like maybe the second meeting in, in February. Uh, the process used for uh, potholes, uh, again, just to kind of make it public. Um, uh, maybe how the guys are trained or the materials they use. Um, and this uh, second uh, would be uh, the rebuilding or reconstruction or the repaving of Constitution. See if we can visit that from Vine all the way to the Club Westerner. It's, uh, it's kind of bad. Uh, see if we can talk about that. The con I'm sorry, Constitution. Constitution Street. Okay, from Vine to, I'm sorry. Either Vine uh, to all the way to the Club Westerner. To Western or Oh, okay, okay, or, or, just because it's 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 really horrible. Yeah, and a couple of events that I've attended there lately, and yeah, had a lot, lot of complaints. A lot of those streets in Old Town are in pretty bad shape. Oh, from we're doing utility work in a lot of that area too. So, but yeah, we'll be glad to uh, talk about when that's because scheduled, and so, and then the how we do pothole repair is not a problem. And it's, well, to see if it's uh, a repaving or a rebuild job or sure. Sure. Just a, a second meeting in February would be nice. February or January? February. February. Okay. Second meeting. It, it give him some time. Okay. I mean, I, I, not to speak for Don, but I, I promise you, he can have it on the January fifteenth meeting if you want it sooner. The pothole issue is an easy one to address on how we do that. Okay. So uh, it's it's up to y'all. Whenever y'all want it, it's fine. Yeah. I, I had someone ask me about airline, and that might be actually getting into capital improvement. But if we could throw that into the, the mix too and that would be you, nice i'm throwing that in before you commit to a date all the range brought up a lot of conversation and mm -hmm. complaints I'm, you have but, a uh, specific area of airline or just in general i know where you i know where they just talking. said in general but i think they okay. probably meant what between Lorraine by the outfall Lorraine didn't yeah. mean yeah. Yeah. by the outfall by the outfall yeah. yes. by manner well, I can, yes yeah, yeah, yeah i can address by the bridge <laughs> i can address yeah. that one right now um we're going to be Part of our downtown project, we have some uh, <coughs> paving in that project. Uh, once this last phase of downtown, uh, there's some milling that goes on with that. What we plan to do is when that company comes in, we're going to see if we can't fit that section and maybe a couple more into uh, into that project and have it done all at the same time. So we're, we, we have a plan to address that area soon. What would milling mean? Uh, you're going to basically it's it's real unlevel. There's a lot of undulation in there. So we'd mill it down and then pour it back flat, take that section out, just that one section, mill it down to the base. And then we could lay that back down with hot mix. And there's a there's a I don't remember off the top of my head, but I, there's at least two more places that we we plan to do that as well. Thank you. Sure. Oh, and I want a little segue into one quick thing, Ms. Solis, before we do okay. yours. <laughs> I, I mentioned this this morning at a meeting. I got this in the mail. Um, I don't know if you all did. I showed this to some of you. Did you get it, Andrew? I did. <laughs> um, I, was, uh, I went to Dairy Treat the other day, and, and I'll tie back to this, but um, went down Crestwood from Navarro, which is where your business is, and you know, down there by Shields School. It's embarrassing, Chris, what it is. Of course, tonight we're going to hopefully approve the engineering to get started to redo all that road. I know, can't happen fast enough, but, you know, that road, that's just, it's embarrassing. And then uh, while I was 
parked in Dairy Treat. Someone sent me a message about their residential streets. And then I went home to eat, and this was in my mailbox, and it's, you know, property taxes increasing at an alarming rate. Stop the hidden property tax. This is paid for by Texas Association of Realtors. You can uh, sign a petition to join other Texas in telling your elected leaders in Austin something must be done now. So I get these roads, as you guys know, and some of our audience members know, that are, that are nothing but a joke. And, and we have plans. We just don't have the money, yet I get this on the other end. you know. And I started looking at revenue in taxes, and I'll, I'll try to be brief. This is not a debate. It's not on the agenda. But, you know, the revenue that citizens inside the city limits pay to taxing authorities. And I had a hard time trying to find the federal taxes, but I, IRS doesn't like to tell you the taxes paid from people in a municipal boundary, but they will tell you by zip code. So I did some estimation, and it looks like personal income taxes alone paid by people who live in the city is $250 million. And I would you know, maybe double that for corporate tax. I don't know. So that's what, $500 million a year to the federal government. And then, as I've mentioned in the past, the state of Texas taxes about $120 million from people inside the city limits through sales tax. And here we are collecting about forty-five to do everything that we have to do. And that's why Crestwood looks the way it does. So, you know, um, I don't like property taxes. Anybody in here want to raise their hand who likes property taxes? But I also know what we do with that money and what we're trying to do. And it's very frustrating. And I think people, I hope, will understand more over time. We're the least of their tax burdens. The only deal is, is they just know what they pay because they get that one bill a year. No one knows what they pay the state because you don't add up off your receipt every purchase you make in sales tax. So anyway, it's very frustrating to try to do the things we do. And I hope, I, I, I want to spend the next few months talking to people about it and trying to educate them. So... I'll stop. I'll get off my soapbox for a minute there on that. I just wanted to share that. Anything else under items from council before we? Well, under that note, I always like to tell everybody, you took all the property taxes that Victoria receives in one year. It'll pay for the budget for the police department or the fire department, but not both. Right. So we also get sales tax. So if you take the sales tax revenue and the property tax revenue, it'll pay for the police and the fire budget with a million, million and a half left over, depending on what kind of year we're having. Yeah. Very frustrating. Okay. Ms. Solis. Yes, sir. I wanted to bring up the game room ordinance uh, and have a discussion with the landlords because I've gotten calls from the landlords concerning the liability that they would have under this ordinance. So I asked for that to be pulled so we could discuss it. And... I'm glad that you brought it up, Council Member Solis. As we mentioned the last time that when you did bring it up, like you, I've gotten questions from <clears throat> property owners. I've had at least four of them in my office asking me about the affirmation that we require them to sign. And in order to make sure everybody understands where we're coming from, I've asked James to put the language of the ordinance up on to a PowerPoint slide, and that way the TV station can pull that and put it directly up on the screen, I understand, as well, so that the general public can understand exactly what we're talking about. <clears throat> <clears throat> Under our new game room ordinance, Section 14-146 requires that a game room permit not be issued to a permittee unless the landlord sign an acknowledgment on the application. And the acknowledgment reads as follows. It's on the, the PowerPoint slide, but I want to read it out loud. I own the property described in this application, and I have actual knowledge of the proposed or current operation of a game room on my property. I acknowledge that I may be held personally criminally liable for illegal activity associated with the game room on my property, including the keeping of a gambling place under Chapter 47 of the Penal Code, operating an unauthorized game room under Chapter 14 of the City Code and other applicable penal statutes. Mm -hmm. That's the statement that we require property owners to sign. The reason that's included in our ordinance is because when we were drafting this, I came to the conclusion personally that property owners didn't realize that they were subject to criminal liability by allowing game rooms to illegally operate within their property. And so this acknowledgement is in the <coughs> ordinance specifically <coughs> to draw that to their attention so that they will know 
that they have liability. I've told you I've had four people come into my office and ask me about this, and I've gotten now to where my first question in response is, are you aware that you are already criminally liable regardless of whether you sign this statement? And I frequently get blank stares in response to that question. Property owners are not aware that they are criminally liable if someone is illegally operating a game room on their property. Let me show you where that comes from because it's not our city code. It's not something that we put into place. This is state law. This is the state penal code, section 47.04A. And it says, a person commits an offense if he knowingly uses or permits another to use as a gambling place any real estate, building, room, tent, vehicle, boat, or other property whatsoever owned by him or under his control or rents or lets any such property with a view or expectation that it be so used. That's a class A misdemeanor under state law. And I think our property owners, I am convinced now that our property owners did not know that they were criminally liable if their tenant is using their building for illegal gambling activities. So the purpose of having that affirmation on the application is to make sure that they are aware of it. Now, if a property owner is convinced that the that the game room is operating legally and they want to sign that affirmation, it that's fine. Signing or not signing that affirmation does not change their criminal liability. They are just as liable whether they sign it or not. But we're not going to issue a game room permit to a game room unless we're confident that the property owner knows that they are exposed. Okay, can you do me a favor and explain <coughs> illegal activity by a game room? Sure. Um, in this section, that would be illegal gambling. Uh, and the, the penal code provisions about gambling are pretty broad. A placing of a bet is illegal. There are all sorts of exceptions to that. If obviously I'm holding a card game in my own house and you know there's, the house doesn't take winnings, that's an exception, for example. With regards to the eight-liner machines that are being played, there is a very limited exception. Those eight-liner machines, the way that I understand they're being used in Victoria, many of them are illegal. The only way that it is legal is if the person playing the machine wins no more than $5 per play. $5 is the maximum. If that game pays out any more than that, it is illegal, and that person just committed a crime. And that is why we require in the new ordinance that the game room post a sign like this. This is one inch tall letters, just like our code requires. And this sign must be posted on the door of the game room, as well as at the location where the payouts are made. And it says gambling is a crime. If you win more than $5 per play, you may be arrested and fined $500. And again, that penalty comes from state law, not our local code. We want to make sure that our citizens are aware that they are taking a risk if they are playing a game and they are getting paid more than $5 per play. Is that in monetary value or is that like in prizes? The, pr the award that is given must be in a non-cash prize that has a value of less than $5. So they, they can't pay cash even if it's $4.50. So $4 worth of toilet paper, you're okay. $4 plushies, you're okay. I understand, but the thing is okay. You're playing in, a, uh, in an eight-liner machine and you hit a jackpot, okay. You can't get more than $5 for that one game? That's exactly right. And that's state law. That's state law, and it's not new, by the way. That's been the case. 
Gambling has been illegal in Texas for as long as Texas has been Texas. I can go back and show you cases from 1846, the year after Texas became a state, where gambling was illegal. So this hasn't changed. This isn't new. Okay. Any other questions while it's on our agenda? You okay, Josephine? You done? Yeah, okay. Yeah, Mr. Delagarza? <clears throat> Was there a law, an exception to the law, or some type of if and or buts that were that was allowing some of these uh, uh, places to, to give more than five dollars per play. Not that I'm aware of. No, I believe that most of the game rooms in town, all of them that were paying out more than five dollars per play, were violating state law. No exception. And I think the district attorney, and I don't know. I don't want to speak out of turn. Maybe JJ or somebody didn't really want to prosecute these two vigorously. Is that a true statement? I don't remember where we went. With. There were a lot of situations with that. I, maybe we're opening a can of worms when we're talking about that. Let, yeah, okay, never mind. Let me say we will have a new district attorney one way or the other I understand in, that. in January. And yeah. it, we will see what happens with the prosecution of these offenses. I know I got a lot of complaints, negative complaints, get tired of it, got pulled over in stores and chewed out and a lot of messages over the last several years. It was very annoying. Just saying, I, you know. Okay. There's been calls for changing the gaming laws at the state level every session for as long as I can remember. Yeah. There's someone proposing to bring in gambling to pay for what? What was it? Is today's paper? Yeah. So, <coughs> education or something. I forget. Maybe that money help us fix some roads. Okay. Now, I there's think a they lot tried of leakage. that with the lottery. There's a lot of leakage to Louisiana, Oklahoma, and, and, <laughs> and Vegas, but <coughs> that's not for us to discuss necessarily. When did they here. start? January 2nd? When does it say, go on up there and tell them, make it legal then? Go for it. If I can make one other point Sorry. about game rooms, and I know that this isn't in response to a question, but I do want to point out that all of the game room permits in the city expire December 31st. That has been our code for as long as we've had game room permits. And so all of the current application, all of the current game rooms um, will need to have new permits in order to continue operation after January 1st. As of this afternoon at about five, excuse me, 4.30, when I last checked, there are no game room permit applications that have been submitted to the city yet. And so if a game room operator intends to operate after January 1st, I urge them to get their application in. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Is that good enough? Yeah. I don't want to cut anybody okay, out. I just want to also say the dates that City Hall is going to be closed so they can get their permits. <laughs> okay? Yeah. We're closed uh, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, the 24th and 25th. And uh -huh. so and we're closed on New, uh, New Year's Day, January 1, but that's... <laughs> that's already the deadline. That's, okay. Yeah. But the 31st, are y'all... We're here. Yes, ma'am. Okay, we are so here. Okay, so we have till the 31st, guys. Okay. Yeah. Monday and Tuesday is next yeah. week. And it's not a just overnight turnaround, right? No, sir. It, mm -mm. It'll take a few weeks. So to it'll take a few weeks. Yeah. Holy moly. Okay. Yeah. Better show up or they can move out to the county. So. The application requires fingerprinting. <laughs> it requires background checks. It requires uh, documentation from the state of Texas. It's a complicated application. It's not the same application that it was last year. But I think some of the people think it is the same application. <coughs> that's right. Nope. Uh, All right. And that's and that's one of the reasons that we, um, you know, Thomas and the chief worked hard to get it to you guys early November, so businesses would have a chance to start that application process. Sometimes it takes a while because of the holidays. Yes, you know, it so. does. Did it, it require fingerprinting in the past? Uh, it, it was recently that we changed to require fingerprinting, and I believe when we made that change, we included game rooms in it. We went through, and maybe April can help me remember the dates. 
we changed all of the background checks to require fingerprinting, I think about six or eight months ago. And at that time, it was added into the game room permit ordinance. And then we kept it when we did the game room rewrite. So, like, would they have to be re-fingerprinted or just have the background check run? The fingerprinting, if they have previously done it, mm -hmm. will, I think it's good for three years. Is that right, Chief? He's nodding his head. He thinks that's right okay. as well. Um, but if they have not yet done fingerprinting, they will need to get that done. Thank you. Sure. It was done in 2017. Oh, that was 2017. Wow, time flies. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, and the, the paperwork that's required from the state, what exactly are you requiring from the state? We require that they get us a copy of their receipt from the comptroller's office. Remember, a properly licensed game room also has to be licensed by the state of Texas, and they will receive permits from the comptroller's office for each and every machine in that in that uh, game Is room. Is those those little stickers? I believe the comptroller issues stickers? stickers as well. Some of the stickers are ours. Right. Some of them also. Okay. Uh -huh. And so they need to bring to us a copy of their receipt showing that they have paid for those before we will issue them a city permit. Okay. And, okay, they, I guess the state comptroller website was probably where they would go get it. I, I'm not sure where they submit that information, okay. but I, they should have a receipt. The comptroller's office assured me that they hand out written paper receipts with each of those applications. Okay. Thank Good. you. Okay. Anything else from council? <coughs> All right. We'll close items from council. We'll move into citizens communication. Um, if you want to come up and speak, come up to the podium and just your name. Don't need your address. If you try to limit your comments to five minutes out of courtesy of everyone else. It was three yeah. minutes last time. Yeah, we, we, yeah, we bumped it up a little earlier. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm Michael Vondro. I live at East North Mobile Home Park, and we have dangerous dogs and uh, dogs at large. I spoke to you about it last time, and um, I got the uh, names of the people that own them and their address, 21B and number 2, and I was wondering if police officers could write tickets for these dangerous dogs and dogs at large. They chase people all at night and I'll give any one of you 20 bucks if you want to ride your bike through there at 8 p.m. Uh, tonight you know because you you will get chased by that Rottweiler on number two I spoke to the trailer park manager on no November the 30th and wrote him a letter and he didn't help and uh, I don't know the name of the uh, owner and it's like a swamp and I over there because there's leaks I don't know if it's a leak from the pipes and the the cars have to go around and uh everything and i was hoping someone could drain the swamp you know because uh <laughs> i mean there's potholes there and no one has any plans to fix it or anything and um, <coughs> um it, it's just th those are the two big issues and uh everything i've been with uh, animal control since may and i haven't got no help no tickets been written or anything and um, these dogs, they run in packs and, you know, three to, and they're, they're harassing customers at Family Dollar. I got pictures of them and everything. And, you know, they've been, customers been complaining at Family Dollar and everything. They've been all over the place. And I was hoping someone could uh, do something. The trailer park manager isn't going to do <clears throat> nothing, you know. Michael, you've called... Uh, animal control on, on yeah, the phone? Yeah, How many times? Um, I mean, it's probably about 50 or 60 times, and they haven't, I even went in person, and they refused to uh, write citations for them, and uh, they gave me a trap, and then I trapped the dogs, and then they, uh, like I told you last time, then they pay $170, and then they let them out, and then a month later, I trap them again, they pay another 170 to animal control, and they let them out. These dog owners aren't responsible and i was wondering if you could hold the trailer park manager uh criminally responsible and uh -oh. the dog owners <laughs> criminally responsible if they bite someone and hurt them you know and civilly responsible too because they have no intention of doing anything or taking care of it and uh, i've been working with animal control and the police since may of this year and nothing's been done and in, in the last time you were here, I think you spoke to the police chief. Is that correct? Yeah, yes, uh, okay. he gave me some pointers. You know, he, he said use the term dangerous dogs. And these are dangerous dogs. <laughs> they chase um, 
people, uh, other animals, uh, cats, whatever. These aren't just nuisance dogs barking. These are dogs that's never, not even once uh, with a leash. You know, I, I know the people's name and uh, everything. I know where they live. I got pictures and animal control. Uh, will not write them a citation uh, as far as with the city because I, I know it's $252 for a dangerous dog. $252 uh, for a dog's at large, and, you know, paying $85 a day is no problem for them. So I was thinking, man, if I please write them a ticket for $252 for a dangerous dog and $252 at dogs at large, man, they'll run them broke, and, you know, they'll restrain them or take care of them. And these owners don't have no intention of taking care of the problem, and the trailer park owner has no intention of taking care of the problem. Okay, let me, uh, let me <clears throat> since you're here a second time now, there may be a code enforcement issue. In other words, we have a department that looks at codes. And Julie, do you know where he's talking about? Or should he call code enforcement? Just in the phone book under city, if you call code enforcement, they will look. I, I talked to them. They said we're not responsible. Well, I'm talking about there may be with water and other issues. Now, let me say this with oh, okay. respect to the animals. Animal control is a, is a, actually run by the county, not the city, mm -hmm. but they do it on our behalf. It's part of a service. Yeah. Uh, I know a county commissioner that I don't mind calling for you and asking I him if he will it. talk to you. Uh, JJ, I'll, I'll, I don't mind doing that. Do you have Michael's contact information by chance? Or if y'all could, if you give it to the police chief, if that's acceptable, sure. I'll, I know a county commissioner that may give you a call. I, but y'all want to interject? It. And I know we can't debate up here because right. it's on the agenda, but Thomas, I, we've got an ordinance for yes. irresponsible pet owners that uh, he can file a ca uh, with the court. Even, I mean, even more court. than even more than that. And if you'll give your contact information to the police chief, I will get it from him, and I will call you this week. Okay. There is a process in our city code that allows a citizen to file charges directly in municipal court for what we call a dangerous dog. Now that is a dog that has made an unprovoked attack against a person. And so I don't know whether these facts necessarily are gonna fit with that, but that'll be part of the conversation you and I have mm -hmm. when I contact you later, okay? And and I'll help you through the process of filing that yourself in municipal court. I've talked to him about that and the way I understand, you guys sue them, right? You're suing an uh, individual, right? There's, there's several different processes that can happen. Uh, a person who has been injured can file a civil suit against the dog owner. The mm -hmm. process in civil court is, excuse me, the process in municipal court is a civil process that mm -hmm. can result in the dogs being removed from the home. Yeah, I just, I don't want to get to where I have to sue them. I just want them to take care of the problem, you know. I, I understand. Let, let's continue this conversation later this week. Thanks. Appreciate it. Sure. Uh, what is that address of that trailer park? <clears throat> we can get it. Uh, uh, Michael. It's, it, it's 2204 East North Street, uh, 20A. What's the name? East North Mobile Home Park, and Brandon Falk is the uh, trailer park uh, manager. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, well, we do have the one item on citizens' communications. It was <clears throat> put there early, but uh, we're still open if anyone else would like to get up. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. And I do like your shirts. I like the casual look. I don't think they should have to wear ties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, and I do appreciate what you do. And I do appreciate you talking about streets. And uh, the residential street program, I think you really need to talk about each aspect of the strategy and really discuss it. And the reason I brought up the thing about potholes is because, like I said, it's going to be a long time before my streets get done. And in the meanwhile, I have to get out of my neighborhood. And I have to play, when it rains, I have to play Mario Kart. And I like playing it with my grandson on my big screen TV, but I don't like playing it in my car. And that's the reason I brought it up. A lot of subdivisions have been are going to be put off. If my streets were to be done next year, I would still be up here asking you to do something about the potholes in my neighborhood because I still have to get in and out of my neighborhood. That's the reason I brought it up. 
I know streets cost a lot of money. I, I've sat out there for five years. I've sat through a lot of budget meetings, and the mayor's right. They cost a lot of money. And uh, people can't, but people need to understand, but they will only understand if you discuss the process. And the only way the process will get better is if you actually discuss those strategies and what you're doing with them. So I appreciate Ricky bringing up about the potholes. I appreciate you talking about streets. Keep the conversation going. Thank you. Have a good Christmas. Thank you. Donald, I think you ought to make a cross section of a pothole, put it on a wagon that you can. <laughs> as a, I'm serious. I've seen really good illustrations, but build one. When I'm out of office, I'll do that for you. So. Okay, I'm sorry. Citizens communication is still open. If anyone, I know Ms. Vasquez has asked to be on. If you're here or would like to speak, you can, or anyone. Or her representative. Or her representative. Now would be the time. Hi. My name is Dorothy Crager. I have a business. Um, everybody here has a business. And nobody has to sign on the dotted line that says, I can be held responsible for anything that happens in a rental house or a parking lot or the city zoo or anywhere. Why do we, as business owners of buildings, have to sign this permit because he decides to make us put our name on the dotted line? I mean, it might be a law and we might be sued, but why do we have to put that on that permit? That's like saying, okay, we're guilty before we're guilty. Everybody's guilty before this happens, right? Or not right? It's talking about the game room. It's the game room ordinance thing. Why? Why did you make us sign this paper? Why don't you make the city sign a paper that says, if the water spills, you're guilty? Why? I want to know. I pay lots of taxes in Victoria, a whole lot of taxes. And I don't want to be sued every time I get a permit and it signs, I sign it and say I'm going to be sued just because I leased it to Rick or you or John Doe. It's not right. Thank you. <clears throat> Citizens communication still open? If anyone would like to, anyone else on any other issue, now would be the time. I don't. I want to make sure I give everybody a chance. Don't want to cut anybody off. Okay, we'll go ahead and close citizens' communication, and we'll move to into section C, which is some public hearings. C1 is the first and the second public hearing on the annexation proceedings as required by Texas local government code for expedited annexation proceedings when the annexing an area with less than 100 separate tracts of land for the proposed annexation of up to approximately 250 acres of land, which includes portions of Placido Benavides Drive and Salem Road rights of way near the vicinity of the intersection of the proposed Placido Benavides Drive and Salem Road and the presentation of annexation service plan. So, Council, this is just a public hearing. There's no vote, and it's kind of unique. I don't remember ever having to do it. We have two public hearings, so I have to open it and close it twice. This is procedural. So, uh, with respect to C1, we'll open the public hearing now. If anyone wants to speak to this item, now is the time. Maybe they'll come up on the second one. <laughs> okay, I'm going to close the first public hearing on C1, and now we'll reopen the public hearing on C1. If anyone would like to speak to this item, now is the time. Okay. Seeing no one, we'll, we'll close the second public hearing on C1, and we'll move into C2. C2 is also a public hearing on the CDBG Consolidated Annual Performance and Evaluation Report for the period of October 1st, 2017 to September 30th, 2018. Okay, again, no vote on this. Uh, we'll open the public hearing on the CDBG 
<clears throat> annual performance and evaluation, evaluation report. If anyone would like to speak to that item alone. Okay. No one jumping up. We'll close the public hearing on that. We'll move to C3. C3 is an ordinance amending Chapter 15 and Chapter 24 of the Victoria City Code to update and revise alarm system content for compliance and relevance, add fees for alarm system permits, and a false alarm fine schedule, repealing all conflicting ordinances, providing for enforcement, codification, publication, and savings, and declaring an effective date. We'll open the public hearing on C3 if anyone would like to speak to this item. Come on up. Just move that officer out the way. He don't mind. Okay. <laughs> Ron Reyna. Uh, now, fees, are these fees for installers or are these fees for actual people who have alarms installed? It's not clear. Ron, I'm, I'm sure you're aware, but I'll make it clear for the general public that on items that are that are posted for a public uh, hearing, uh, council doesn't okay. typically respond during your speaking time. However, I'm sure that... that uh, the police officer will be happy to address that comment. Okay. Uh, okay, so there's fees. I, that's that's just my concern. Uh, there's a lot of people with alarms in this town. Uh, uh, I'd like to see, you know, what the uh, the nuisance fees are. Uh, I know that's probably in the public record somewhere. I'd like to get pointed in that direction so I can see it. Uh, but my concern is, uh, you know, what, what the fees are and who's responsible for them. That, that's all I have. Thank you. We'll, we'll get that answered for you. But the public hearing is still open. If anyone else wants to speak to this item. <coughs> okay, seeing no one, we'll close public hearing. I'll entertain a motion. Move to adopt. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion, a second. And let's see, maybe we can answer, get those questions answered now, officer. Um, Good evening, Mayor and members of council. The, to answer his questions, the the fees would apply to the people that the, have the alarms. They would not be charged to the alarm companies that provide the service. Okay. Previously, it was the alarm company. There are no fees in place at this time charged to anyone other than to the alarm user for after the eighth one, they begin to charge, we begin to charge $60 in a, per eight or more in a 12 month period. So what the alarm system permit fee, what is that funding? That's basically for, um, for the administrative cost to have a permit. And then that gets it into the system where they would begin to be, um, would build. We have no record of how many alarm companies uh, or alarm users are in the city right now. There's an estimate of probably six percent of the citizens have, but um, there's no there's no way for us to quantify that number or to track that number because we don't know. We can go off of the amount of alarm calls that we answer, which is a little over three thousand false alarms a year, uh, that equates to about four or five hours. Um, a day that we respond to false alarms. Um, but that's the only way. We don't know who else has an alarm alarm system. <clears throat> and, so, and Mark, and that's what prompted the <clears throat> ordinance was the false alarms and, uh, you know, residents or alarm companies not um, repairing their alarms and the time that y'all are taking and that you might back up a little bit and just okay. uh, explain that if you don't mind what prompted yes, the police department to want this well that is we, we spend a lot of time uh, make sure i hope you understand when an alarm call comes in it has such a high priority number that we may have officers on the streets or on other calls but because of this high priority number they get pulled away from that and they respond to the businesses or residents or something like that 90% of the amount of alarm calls that we receive end up being false for faulty systems. Uh, the people that are using the alarm systems don't know how to properly put in a code or something like that. And what's happened is those officers are pulled away from a call that, that they may need to be on that's a lower priority only to get there and spend 30 minutes checking the place to realize that it's false. And we're trying to, the initiative, the thought behind it is to implement a new initiative to reduce or eliminate 
the false alarms. So if that's the the goal of it, why don't we just have a false alarm fee? I, I don't like this that because I have an alarm, now I have to pay the city $50 every year. If the problem is false alarms, let's address false alarms. Not everybody. Why is everybody that has maintained their alarm system now responsible for the false alarms? I would rather see us decline this, let them come back with something else that addresses false alarms. That's the issue that it sounds like you're having problems with and takes away from the duties of police officers. And if there's 3,000 a year and 20 bucks for every false alarm you had, there's $60,000 of fines that you've collected. You can't, I don't even know what $50 for each alarm system is going to bring you. Wouldn't know until we did it. And the, so, <laughs> as yes, your sir. collection collectability on that 60 in the past, I'm sorry, sorry. The collectability on the, the previous false alarm fee we had, is there a problem collecting it or what? There is. There are a number of companies that. And I don't know what the outstanding balance for false alarms are, but it's staggering the number of outstanding where they don't. And we've had to actually cancel or threat of cancel response because some of them have been 20 or 30 false alarms that they just haven't paid for. So with a permit, they have to come down and get a permit. They're going to have to pay that before they get that permit. That's correct. And, and I some can of see the, the logic if you don't that. get a permit. Yeah. Well, eventually, if, if you don't get a permit and nothing ever it works fine and they never get false alarms. Yeah, there's no issue. But if they start getting false alarms on a building that doesn't have a permit, yeah. There are some uh, of the research. I'm saying? I know exactly what you're saying. I don't. Uh, well, he just said, and I don't have the information, but because uh, I've had experience with this, I've had false alarms and never over eight, so I didn't get, but uh, what's your collection rate? That's my question. You're not collecting the false alarm fee that was there, it was 60 bucks. Yes. And you just couldn't get that collected. They just ignored you. Did we send them a bill? Yes. What do we do? We do. We and send they them just, a bill. It, but no one follows up with that, so it never gets collected. If they had to get a permit and they came in, we'd pull that up and say, you know, you had 12 false alarms. You cost us a lot of time and money, and we have a fee. And then, of course, they can argue, and then it might end up in your municipal court or. Yeah, I see where you're going. Um, well, you am just I, have a fee for false alarms. You don't pay it, and you have three of them outstanding or a $60 threshold or whatever, and then you don't get responded to. I, but if you don't, yeah, I, I, I hear that. So, in other words, the, the alarm company calls again, and we don't go? Yeah, I treat it more like a parking ticket than, than a we're not going to respond. Yeah. Well, if you don't have a permit and you get a, an alarm, you're still not going to respond? Is that what you're saying? I don't know. I don't know. Good, good question. I mean, um. <laughs> other cities that have introduced or how they've dealt with it have introduced these initiatives and they've suggested a, a registration fee as just one part of it. Other part is a staggered or an escalating fee where it, when it first starts out, it's lower. Uh, and those fees are outlined in the, the Texas local government code. And as it as it becomes more of a problem, they get progressively worse. Uh, and that's one of the options that or one of the uh, deals that we addressed in the proposal before you. What if, uh, and Mr. Bognot, you raise good points, but um, I can see the permit uh, to better, to not penalize people who have one with no false alarms you, if you lowered the permit fee but put the false alarm fee back in place. It's a, it's, to me, it's a tax. You're, yeah. you're, you're pushing yeah. an additional tax. And the same thing you're going to tax over and over every year. Mm -hmm. I'm, I could see a permit fee for an installation of a, of a new system. <clears throat> Just like you would have to get a permit to install an air conditioner or whatever. Get, get it looked over, whatever. But the city doesn't require you to have a permit for your air conditioner every year. It doesn't require you to have electrical permit. I mean, it's well, just a... It's a but, reoccurring tax that you're going to place on anybody that has an alarm system the, where the problem is false alarms. Well, what if it was, I, I, with all due respect, air conditioners are different than this. We're getting calls and we're wasting a lot of officers' time. 
and it is shouldn't be spread on everybody. I agree with you. I mean, for example, let me ask you this: What if there was no permit fee, but required for us to respond? You came in and filled the permit out, but there's no fee, but we reinstate the late fee. How about we do that? So they know where they are, and they know because I mean they're just not paying the late fee, right? That's what I'm hearing. I mean, sorry, officer. I know we <laughs> he thought this was going to be easy, probably. <laughs> They're not paying the fee. What then, do we do? I then, mean, Dana knows about people not paying fees, right? Tom, I'm sorry. Well, I wanted to mention we do have things that are all recurring. You have to have your fire extinguishers inspected each year. If you have a restaurant, you have to have your extinguisher system and HUD cleans and so on like that. There are things that are ongoing. My question with your proposal would be that, okay, so I pay the fee the first year. Five years later, someone else owns a business the contact numbers, all that's wrong. Uh, maybe they went out of business. Maybe the system doesn't work anymore. Maybe it hasn't worked in a while. Is there a mechanism that we could include in your proposal that would perfect the idea that those alarm systems were in somewhat of a decent condition and knew everything else that we need to know? Put it on the fire marshal's checklist. Please? Put it on the fire marshal's checklist for your occupancy permit. Yeah. Well, we don't perhaps, require it for occupancy, perhaps. right? Because like my new one, I'm going to get a hopefully a CO before I, I'll get the alarm next month. Um, I just don't okay. see it as a, no, no, a yearly I'm fee listening. that I'm already paying taxes. Now, yeah, you're, you're subsidizing the wrongdoers. Yeah. It's paying too much. <laughs> but now I'm subsidizing the people that have false alarms. So I, I maintain I, my system. So the question is, is how do we go about collecting from the wrongdoers? And I guess the question Well, they're ignoring Thomas. us, so the permit would bring them back in, and we could charge no fee. They're not the going to come back in anyway. Yep. Well, okay, with no permit, and they don't, excuse me, they don't come in, then that's when it triggers when the alarm company calls. It's an unpermitted alarm. Sorry, where bye. Gonna, we're not going to Where are you going to tie that in? How's that going to tie into the whole process of dispatch? Well, it'll, it'll be part of when I'm sure their system when they pull it up. Uh, let me, let me. It doesn't make any sense. If I don't have an alarm, I'm going to get a response. And so if I have an alarm, but I haven't paid the $50, I'm not going to get a response with, with what you're saying. You know, dispatch says, sorry, you didn't pay your fee. We're not going to yeah, send somebody. I, I know you're mostly yeah. tongue in cheek, but. Well, no, I guess we have to respond, right? I mean, right. they call, we I have to, to respond. Okay, okay. Cost me more than that in fire extinguisher fees. I know that each year. <laughs> and I, uh, How do we attach it to their water bill? Sarmel, <laughs> what you got? I, 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 Jump in. I think here. the key is not to lose focus on, and, and I understand what Mr. Faulkner is saying about the permit. It's it goes back to the false alarm <laughs> fee uh, fines on these people that aren't taking care of it. So if council's okay with, and. Uh, <clears throat> Captain Jameson, maybe what we ought to do, if council wants to, is is not wait to that fourth false alarm on that, that fine. Uh, if if you're proposing and council agrees, you do away with that permit, uh, and but maybe you increase your false alarms because the intent is that hopefully uh, the fines that the fines would be enough that people would pay attention and stop, you know, and maintain their systems. And I, but and I'm not sure if that serves your purpose or not. The key is trying to stop responding to those false alarms. Well, the registration part also helps to quantify your false reduction efforts. If you know how many people have, now whether there's a fee or not, yeah. I guess if there's a registration part to it, then you're able to know whether your numbers are coming down. If you don't know how many numbers of users you actually have and you can't track it, you don't know whether your efforts are working or not. Are you tr you're tracking it right now, though, on who's only only by the those well, who we go and respond to their sure, locations. Sure. We don't know how that compares to the overall number of users within the city. Uh, I, don't I don't see that that's a pertinent information fact. That you know how <clears> many <throat> there are. I mean, if you know you have three thousand false alarms a year, and next year you have fifteen hundred, and the next year you have five hundred, I'd say you did better. Absolutely. But it wouldn't matter that you had 6,000 or 5,000 or 4,000 as the grand total number of alarms out there. That's not what, what would be judging the progress on eliminating false alarms and people maintaining their system. But um, many times businesses are rented. 
it's a rented establishment alarm system goes in. It's a renter, not necessarily an owner. Two years later, another guy's in there. Does that system still active? Is it not? Um, I'm not sure we're all going to be able to quantify those numbers if we don't keep some sort of registration process involved. Or tell me how we can get around that. Well, Secu excuse me. Security companies aren't required to register with y'all? They're going to come knocking at our doors to sell us security systems? Presently, no. I, mean, I thought they, anybody that came knocking at your door had to have a permit. That, that, that's, that's a different solicitation permit. Yeah. permit, yes. And that's different than registering with the police. That would be two different things. <clears throat> but that's correct. If they're going to go door to door, they have to have a permit to do that. I didn't mean to talk over April. That, I'm sorry, yeah. April. But, that's correct. But So this would be a different registration. Ms. Scott. Yeah. Um, I, I hate to be a nervous Nelly, but there's lots of folks that don't trust government, and there's uh, lots of cybersecurity. And I'm not so sure I'm crazy about us building a database of who's got a security system, because that tells us who doesn't. Well, those numbers are already tracked. Your, your alarm company who installs it reports it. So those are at a national and a state level are already tracked. It's just not locally. Yeah, it's just not local, and that's... Yes, um, just one thought. The, the other thing is um, Ms. Garrett said something about false alarms and the four number. I see that the statute or the ordinance used to say eight uh, false alarms, and I, I would, uh, I think I echo Councilman Bachnight, and I would look at that and bring that number down. And, and then how do we properly collect those? It, it's turn, finance does the collection on that. And, I, and Gilbert's not here tonight, but I'd have to I assume after a certain time they're going to turn it over to collection agency. And I don't know if Wesley knows or not, but I can get that information to you. Finance is responsible for all that billing, and we do use collection agencies on things. I'm not, I just don't know on this. So. And as Dr. Young said, is there any way to tie that to a water bill? On doing what with the water bill? Uh, are you talking about billing them through the water bill or? If their fines are not paid, yeah, we wouldn't cut their water off. That's no, is that no, no, sir, we would not yeah, cut their had water that off. Discussion <laughs> no, number of times over the years. I, yeah. I said that tongue in cheek, but uh, no, no, well, sir, that's what Donald, give me a look. <laughs> that's what I said about the parking ticket. <laughs> but I don't know how you'd separate that out, even once you got into that to the that utility system. For, you know, the ordinance does so, and uh, Mark. Um, because this ordinance is new in a sense. Most of it is most of it all new, or is it all pretty new? much? It's a I know you've total worked, revision of what was existing. Work with legal on this, and I'm sorry, but you do have in the ordinance a ability to suspend response. Yes, we do. And so, for those that continue to have those false alarms, you would be able to suspend <clears throat> response. That's correct. Um, so that that is another method too to help in that area. So, um, if we Uh, let's see. I'm trying to think first, if I can make an amendment right now just to take care of it right now and be done with it. Well, it's just first reading, too. I mean, it'll come back, right? Yes, sir. You it could will. Be, have it a little more clear ready on the second one and amend it, too. You can just take, like, the permit fee out if you want and then you know, whatever. It's whatever y'all want to do. I mean, good argument. But is the objection annual fee? Or do you think we just need to go down I don't on see the number that there's, I don't see that there's any, <clears throat> or I haven't heard an argument for why we need to collect information on why everybody has an alarm or who has an alarm. And I don't like that part. I don't, I don't know what don't that number is. You don't think we helps. need to know who has an alarm, to no. how to respond or how to call? No, because um, when the alarm... Well, most alarm systems have a direct connect to your cell phone, your home computer, or other devices so that why does why does the city need to know how many people or which people have alarms it gets it gets it's it's not necessarily that it's the follow-up if your alarm goes off and we respond to your location and we don't know we don't have any information on that other than the location that we're going to we don't know who to contact because oftentimes when we respond after hours to these locations there's no managers there there's no people there and that we just make sure that the places the location is secure and then we go back in service and if that happens repeatedly we have no recourse to follow back on as to who we would bill if we don't know who those alarm users are so you have no way of knowing the property owner not not initially no we'd have to go back you have out an address and, right 
We have an address. That's correct. But uh -huh. not and not. So you would know the property owner. Well, how about if it's a lease over? Uh, like a hey, business. I'm sure the landlord would pass on the fine too. Yeah. <laughs> the, whoever was renting it. I mean, we have a method of assigning that fine to somebody. We respond it to a property. Right. It's on the tax rolls, whether it's a business property there. The tax rolls say who's paying the business property tax. We know who owns the, the building. We know who owns that property for the tax records. All that information's already there. To create another database with it, I don't, I don't see the benefit of it. Mr. Borknight, if I can make a special request here, I'm sorry to interject myself in the conversation. Um, I, I see you mentally formulating an amendment, and, mm -hmm. and you're unsure exactly how to phrase that. I would make a request that if your proposed amendment is anything other than anything more complicated than changing dollar amounts or changing timelines, something very simple and direct, that instead of proposing an amendment, you propose to table this tonight and give staff some direction about what you would like to see in a changed ordinance rather than us try to okay. change something from the idea. dais here. Yep, it's a very good idea. Um, so my direction first, all right, I'll make a motion to table this until the next meeting on January the 3rd. Uh, motion to postpone to a definite date. <laughs> Actually, that wasn't going to be my <laughs> It's very good, but that wasn't going to be my nitpicky point. Um, I think council members may have a difficult time deciding whether or not to vote for your motion to table until they know what changes oh, you. Oh, I'm sorry. Because they may decide they want to vote up or down on, on it the way that it is right now, unless they know what your changes are. So you may want to have that discussion first and then make your motion to table. So trying to think as quick as I can on my feet. Um, I'd like to keep it like it is. Change the false alarms from eight to four. Raise the fee to a hundred dollars, and do away with the permit fee, annual renewal fee, and then leave in the late fee after thirty days. So you're talking about taking the alarm system permit fee off? Yes, the alarm system annual renewal fee off, leaving the late fee that was in addition. And then changing the false alarm fee for an excess of four false alarms and the fine to $100. If I can address that, the state statute outlines what your fees are allowed to be. And the, the ones that are in the recommendation are in compliance with that. It okay. doesn't allow you maximum. to. That's correct. Okay. Which way were you going on the late fee? It sounded like you took it out but then put it back. I'd, I'd like to leave the late fee in there. The There's no reason not to have that in so there. So the fee is again, the I'm fee sorry. is the maximum that can be. Yes, sixty. Then I would move down the false. Yeah. Oh, that's yours. I'm sorry. I apologize. Go to three. Go to three and leave it at sixty. In what time? That's it for in a year, I guess. Again, the statute mm -hmm. starts after the third false alarm. We can begin to bill. So we could say. So upon the fourth three. one, the fourth and fifth okay. would be fifty six. I got it right the first time. Seventy five. How do you? How do y'all track? <laughs> When Let's, an alarm is called false alarm, somebody's got to note that somewhere and track right. we that. Manually, right now, we go through, and if it's weather-related or something yeah. like that, an act of God or whatever, those aren't passed on. If we have multiple ones in a day where we know there's, there's a problem, they're not billed every single time for multiple ones during the day. But we manually get a print or get a printout from the system there's, there's and then go in and count them. Sounds like that's rather arbitrary. Real windy day triggers a bunch of alarms. We're going to ignore those. We, uh, that. Yeah, I had one every time the wind blew real hard and it, it set off. But the, the problem is, let's say I'm a property owner and I'm leasing to a shoe store or whatever, you know, and they want an alarm system. I said, well, you get what you want, but I'm not paying for it. I own the property. You want an alarm system, you get it. So they get it, and they would be the one notified if it goes off in a windy day or whatever. It's not my problem. Mm -hmm. It's Lee Soar's problem. Yeah. Lee Soar's problem. And uh, so I'm not sure we're still addressing that part. You're thinking in terms of home ownership and, you know, your no, home. No, I'm thinking in terms of businesses. Or, okay. Well, uh, vast majority of the businesses are on leased property. 
Okay. You can look up on victoriacad.org, by property address, see who's paying the business property tax on that. That tells you who's got the inventory, who's got the office chairs, desks, computers. That's you accurate. Have it. It's accurate when it's accurate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. I've used it a lot. I know it. Can't tax a poor person anyway. I'm going to tax. What? Uh, I'm sorry. I, I'm not what sure. What was this uh, annual fee for so. connection of alarm well, systems to central system? Five hundred dollars. What was that? That's old. Years ago, the yeah, alarm system was a dispatch. Yeah. Okay. Okay. A couple of things on the, the false alarm fee. It probably should be false alarm fee for each false alarm in excess of three, and then would it be within a calendar year or a time period? Rolling? It's a calendar year. Yes, ma'am. Okay, it's a calendar year. <laughs> yes, ma'am. You're going to have to start tracking that now. Yeah, would it be a rolling 12 month? <laughs> There's no way around it. I but it, I think it should say for each false alarm in excess. So those are my thoughts on it. I'll, <clears throat> I can work with Thomas on it. Um, I'm trying to make sure the blanket officer, covers all the problems. Well, the problems are false alarms. Yes. And how to collect the fines. Well, as long as we can collect the fine and know who to go to collect to. It was my, my concern. Are we addressing that concern? But, you know, not to belabor the point, we send code enforcement notices out to people all the time um, based on the address. So I really, and not to disagree with Captain Jameson, I really don't think it's a problem for us to find out where the notice needs to go. Mm -hmm. I really and truly. I mean, we've got all kinds of ways of doing Occupancy that. Occupancy so, permits. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of ways of doing that. So, Okay, can, um... Do you mind real quick? Let me clarify because I know it seems like uh, sometimes up here it's a little harder to hear than out there. So the false alarm fee, state law, the uh, zero, the 50, the 75, and the 100 is based purely on state law, the tiering and everything. Ma'am, the staggered. Okay, so we that cannot be changed. You can choose, I guess, not to have one. But okay. That's the that's the recommendation, and that's also in the T Texas Police Chiefs Association model ordinance. Okay. The, the staggering, so you yes. could you couldn't start at a hundred dollars on the fourth fine. I'd have to get back to you. I don't okay. believe so. so I you think you're limited it. to the number. That's why I'm saying let us take this back and yeah. bring back first, something second, with a, with another first. proposal. I think the the message that I'm hearing from council members and uh, is that there's a desire to put more uh, emphasis on the false alarm fines mm -hmm. and less emphasis on the front end fees. Absolutely. Um, but if, if Councilman Bucknight wants to table that and we can work out exactly what those numbers are, I think that's something that Captain Jameson and I don't Councilman think it was Bucknight. just fees. I think it was the registration component too is what I heard it's, from. Uh, right, right. Mm -hmm. the annual registration mm -hmm. or the initial registration? <clears throat> Both. Both. I, and, and if you don't mind, uh, Mr. Bucknight, uh, getting something back by January 3rd may be difficult with the holidays and vacations and also if you don't that. mind maybe the 15th. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay, so we have a motion yeah. motion to postpone to a definite date of January 15th. Mm -hmm. Item C3. He just made my inner parliamentarian happy <laughs> <laughs> by making that motion in the correct form. Yes. Second. That's a motion that requires a second. Thank you. Second. Okay, we got a couple seconds. <clears throat> and so we vote on that, and then the original motion and second goes away. And that's just we bring it sure. back. We bring it back, and we actually have a motion already on the floor that's when right, we bring yeah. it back. Yeah. That's right. <clears throat> Excuse me. It just comes back later. It's going to come back right. with the motion, but it's going to read completely if it's, different. If it is a different ordinance when we bring it back, we'll bring it up with a new motion. Okay. Parliamentarily, we could bring it back and say that a motion's already been made, but I don't think that that's fair to the citizens if we uh, have made substantial changes to the ordinance. It's a new ordinance at that point. Okay. Okay. Everybody understand? Now you got your homework assignment for the Christmas holidays to think about. <laughs> All those in favor of the motion to table, say aye. 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 Those opposed, the same. Okay. Ayes have it. Thank you. Good discussion.
Consent agenda. All right, there are five items on the consent agenda tonight that'll be approved with a single vote. They are first, the approval of the minutes of the meeting of December 4th, 2018. Second, a resolution authorizing the city manager to submit an application for and execute all documents necessary to accept specific stop loss insurance from Berkeley in an estimated amount of $583,037 and declaring an effective date. Third is a resolution approving the purchase of digitizing services from MCCI Scanning Solutions LLC via government cooperative purchasing contract for the conversion of Victoria Police Department records currently maintained on microfilm in the amount of $26,597.50, authorizing the city manager to execute all documents necessary to complete this purchase and declaring an effective date. Fourth, there's a resolution awarding the rehabilitation of Waterwell number 20 and 26 to Weisinger Incorporated for their alternate bid of $197,850, authorizing the city manager to execute all documents necessary to complete the project and declaring an effective date. And the fifth is a resolution authorizing the city manager to pay the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality $78,039.85 for the annual water system fee for the city's public water system and declaring an effective date. So moved. Second. Second. We have a motion and a second for the consent agenda. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, the same. Okay, thank you. Item E1 is a resolution authorizing the mayor to execute a contract with Strategic Government Resources, SGR, to conduct the recruitment search for the city manager position in an amount not to exceed $26,500 and declaring an effective date. Motion to approve item E1. Second. second. We have a motion and a second. Are there any questions or discussion? I do know, I, I, I guess I have some. I, I did call the gentleman in charge earlier today and left him a message, but as soon as after uh, the holidays, they'll need to schedule interviews with each of us and try to be flexible. Maybe he can come one time and that'll help cut expenses and schedule our interviews and then you guys can share what you're looking for in this, this person. So expect that contact. Keep an eye out from uh, Mr. Tanner, his last Mark. Mike. Mike. Mike Tanner. I left him a message. He'll call me back, I'm sure, tomorrow. And uh, we'll give him y'all's contact information. So get that started as fast as we can. Any other comments? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, same. Okay, thank you. Item E2 is a resolution authorizing the city manager to execute a professional services agreement with Alliance Transportation Group Incorporated for the development of the Metropolitan Planning Organization's 2045 MTP in the amount of $197,500 and declaring an effective date. So moved. Second. We have a motion, second, and any, any discussion? So are there other entities that contribute into this plan? MPO money? Yes. To this, to this specifically for Alliance Transportation Group. Yes. So, um, as an MPO, we are required uh, by federal law to have an MTP plan that is updated every five years, and so this is paid um, strictly through that MPO grant fund. Uh, we hold back fifty thousand dollars every year from that grant uh, to pay for a new MTP every five years. So this is for the plan for twenty forty five. What I'm asking, I guess, is since this is a metropolitan transportation plan for 2045 and we're hiring um, Alliance Transportation Group with this ordinance, or this resolution, I'm sorry, who else is paying Alliance Transportation Group? What's the total contract amount? Is Victoria County, pay, County paying for any of this? No. Is um, TxDOT? It's Yes, the entire contract is paid through MPO grant funds, which the city is the fiduciary agent for our MPO. That money comes through the federal government to the state, and then it comes to the MPO grant. We're, we're just the holder of the grant, yeah. I guess you right. could say. Yes, yeah. so, so it's it, all reimbursable. We, we would pay um, out the invoices, but then we would be reimbursed 100%. So this 197.5 is, all goes MPO. out of the general fund, but then it goes right back in from another grant? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. I guess if the county was holding the grant, they'd be doing the same thing. That's so. the good part about us being big enough. We actually are the smallest metropolitan area that has an MPO. Yeah. A lot of the fiduciary agents for MPOs are usually council of governments. Um, it's us being the size we are is what it makes us unique. And I think there's only three cities that are fiduciary agents for other MPOs in the state. Okay. If you're not at the table, you don't get a say in anything that happens. You just get what he chunk at you. So it's a really good thing we have an MPO. 
Julie, on this transportation plan, is it something that just encompasses what's existing, or is it talking about new routes and new ways that we're going to get into the city or, you know, expand out? It's a comprehensive plan, so it doesn't just look at our road network. It also looks at um, other forms of transportation, such as rail and ports, but... Um, really, the requirement of the plan and why it's so vital and necessary to have this plan is that all projects that um, all road projects or, or transportation construction projects, the actual you know overpasses that are built and roads that are built, um, they have to be represented in your plan before that money can be expended. And so we will do a, a comprehensive call for projects, um, do a lot of public input, and so we will be looking at all of those things. We'll be looking at existing um, road connectivity and condition, um, system maintenance system expansion, all of those components will be in this plan. On the new and old roads yes. and yes, whatever. We're, okay. Yeah, and some examples of recent projects that were on previous plans, your Hansman overpass. Nursery road nursery overpass. Nursery road overpass, um, the, the bridge. frontage roads um, at Mockingbird are on the loop. The Guadalupe River bridge expansion. Mm -hmm. You know, those are the type. 63. Uh, uh, yes. The frontage roads, 87 to 185. Yeah, it's all on-system roads. And what I mean by on-system, state of Texas maintained, desktop maintained roads. Yeah, this is not residential streets. <laughs> 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 Okay. But it is completely funded through the MPO grant. Okay. Thank you. One of them is uh, one that might fly under the radar screen on most everybody was on um, uh, near DuPont going to the Barge Canal. There was a dangerous intersection there, a number of accidents and everything. And the MPO arranged for the engineering on that text out to provide it to funding. And we got a light put there. It's cut down on the accident and saved some lives. Not a big deal unless it was your life that got saved. But aren't they talking now about putting an overpass there? Please, sir? Aren't they talking now about putting an overpass right there? They've asked us, the uh, Port Authority has asked us not to. Oh, okay. Because they have projects that would change the location of that entryway that they hope will come to fruition. Okay. So the funding wasn't there anyway, but you put it in your plans, just like we do with the projects we have for the city. And, but, the, but they said, let's notch it down some, because if this wonderful project we've been trying to get does actually happen, we'd want to move that down about a quarter mile to three-eighths of a mile. Well, then you'd have a bridge in the wrong place. Yes. Oh, no. okay. yeah. So they've asked us to delay it, but it's still on the plan. Okay. Is that pretty grudge? Anyway, these kind of fly under the radar screen, and you don't see why there's important to have an MPO to start talking about some of these little things. And they build up to make a big thing. So we do plan. What do you know? <laughs> Out to 2045. Imagine that. Okay. Any other questions, Council? No. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Thank you. E3 is a resolution authorizing the city manager to create a trusting agency account for the purpose of receiving multi-million, uh, excuse me, a multi-year donation from the Marsha Shanklin Foundation. I'm sure we would accept a multi-million dollar grant if, <laughs> if me misspeaking could just make it so, I'm sorry, to receive a multi-year donation from the Marsha Shanklin Foundation in the amount of $301,000 for the purpose of constructing a splash pad facility in Riverside Park to accept all donations for this project as may be received from time to time and declaring an effective date. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Are there any comments or questions for Mr. Colby? Or Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, absolutely the Marsha Shanklin Foundation. Wow, that's uh, very generous of them. And they helped build the other one over in uh, Ethel Lee Tracy. So yes, can't say enough good about it. Are we going to wait till we get all the money before we start construction? Uh, yes, ma'am. We have to have all the money before we can start <laughs> construction. So. I thought maybe we could use general fund. Okay. Uh, Sorry, I, Kobe. <laughs> well, and, Co and Kobe really and Parks will continue to seek other grants to augment uh, this money. So, okay. I did have some questions for Colby and, and Julie in regards to CDBG funding, and, and I'm waiting for a couple of answers uh, and clarifications back as well. And its availability of use in the park. Correct. Great questions. Yeah. On CDBG yeah. money. Correct. We've all. Yeah. I mean, Julie can answer that. I I asked her and. Yeah, she. I'd like, I mean, she can answer. Are you ready that. to answer now, or do you want to, per our conversation? 
Oh. So uh, the, the question was more in relation to how um, were previous projects funded in other areas. And I th believe that there were some changes that is, I'm going to research as far as this in the CDBG program. But the answer um, from our federal rep has always been that um, Riverside is a regional park. And so even though it's in an eligible census tract, it being a regional park, it um, is not eligible for CDBG funds. But as far as ah, certain other areas where we've used the funding in the past, I'm going to research on on then we need to designate the children's park area as a separate area from Riverside Park. That's a possibility. The other question was the fact that we did it over at the uh, former Gary T. Moses pool area and calling that a neighborhood park where it seems to be pretty regional. I had a question about Riverside versus that. So, I th I And think it is a in Riverside, I will argue, is still a neighborhood park to those people that live in that neighborhood. Although it's bigger than everybody else's. <laughs> well... Labels, mm -hmm. strings attached. Colby's grinning, though. He likes your idea. I, I can't say I, I think I it would be a great use of the money if it's possible. You know, it's, it's funny because I, we talked, I think I talked to you about it, and it's, we've always been frustrated, wanted to use more of that money down there, but, you know, I... I know it's a regional I, park, but those that live in the neighborhood, that's their neighborhood. Well, I know. And then we're punishing them we, for where they live. We have a, a, true, we have a staff that follows rules, even sometimes when they're dumb rules, you know, but uh, I bet we could work something out. I think you're on the right track. I'd love for it to be gray. I understand. <laughs> I know. The, the better know, but the we amenities, do. The, the more regional the park becomes, though. Yeah, yeah. yeah. As anyway. we improve the amenities, more people come to them and they become regional. I'm sure it's definitions that, but. That's a reality. There is, size-wise definition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we might yeah. not be able to. We'll yeah. bring the conversation back up to our CDBG. Councilman Bachman had a great idea about sure parceling that off. They're all and the same. Yeah, and Riverside North, Riverside, Riverside with, South. And within the rules. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, we look forward to it. I know that this project is a little bit more than just a splash pad. From, from what I understand, you're hoping there'll be bigger, there'll be slides and bigger things. A little bit more to it all part of the overall playground plan over there. So I'd look, I know you, you want to come up and tell us more? That's okay. I, that whole area. Yes, we do believe this would not, this would, the vision for this, depending on funding, of course, would be that it's, it's, it's going to be larger and, and more, at, at, you know, activities and, and p potential with slides and different things than, than because it is such a large park and, and the majority, you know, how many people come down to that facility. And so if, when I, when I put in there splash pad facility, it's going to, it would be a lot different than what you would see like at Ethley Tracy or uh, the other two facilities that we have. And so I don't want to get that too confused in that sense. Okay. So it might be a multi-million dollar project. <laughs> I'm going to hold Thomas accountable for that. So. Hey, I'm sure Colby would accept the grant if somebody will, wants I'll to give the city multi-million yes, dollars. Yes, I will. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. No further discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? All right. E4 is a resolution authorizing the city manager to execute a contribution in aid of construction agreement with AEP <clears throat> Texas for streetlights on Placido Benavides Street Extension Project in the amount of $209,093.66, declaring an effective date. Move to approve item E4. Second. We have motion and second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same. Okay. E5 is a resolution authorizing the city manager to execute a professional services agreement with Victoria Engineering Incorporated doing business as Urban Engineering for engineering design services for the Crestwood Drive reconstruction project phase two in the amount of $284,150 and declaring an effective date. So move. Second. Well, that was a fast motion and second on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, hurry up, get, get it done. done. All right. So Mr. Reese, got a couple questions. On the first section, what's the proposed bid date? Uh, we're looking to uh, bid that one in mid-January, I believe. Okay. And then I might have overlooked it, but on this uh, PSA, I didn't see a design timeline or completion date for the design. Um, I'm sorry, I do not. I do not have those dates. I know we're going to start that as soon as possible, and uh, 
if it goes by with the other with about the same time frame as the other one did, it, it took roughly a, roughly a year. Tom is here with Urban. He may be able to speak to that just a little bit. Well, shouldn't we have that in the contract somewhere on deliverables? Um, you have a timeline on that? We don't normally do that at, in the engineering department. We don't normally do that in the engineering profession because it's a process. It's a design process and just things can happen. Um, this one took longer than, than we would like, but there were a lot. When we say a year, I mean, it, it, that's a long time because remember, you have to do topo. It just takes time. And we've had some discussions. There, there have been some interesting uh, issues on this one. Uh, so we're expecting about a year? No, I think no. we'll do this one faster. Okay. No, it, it probably seven, six, seven months. Uh, one of the issues we had was was uh, we flew this with a drone, okay? But you can't fly a drone there because we're too close to the tower. So it took us a while to get special permission, and, and we really wanted to do it with a drone because you get way more information with an aerial photo that is to scale. I mean, it's just not a picture. Too close to the control tower? At the airport. For a drone? Uh-huh. On Crestwood. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen a lot of air traffic get, over there, but... Which means you have to get permission from FAA. the FAA, mm -hmm. which is the government, the federal government, okay? <laughs> and I will say that, that the Jack... Uh, what's his name? Jack, the, the guy that runs the control tower... Uh, helped us a lot to get, it took us about three months to get permission that we thought we had. It, it's a very long three story. <laughs> three months. It's way longer than that, but. Uh, I'll sit next to your rotary next time. I'll, I'll try to tell you, I'm not sure I can, but uh, okay. one arm of the government said we had permission, one said we didn't, so. Anyway, All right. so Thank we've you got that, that ironed out typical. so that we, we'll be faster this time. Okay. And, We'll go as fast as we can, I promise. Thanks, Tom. All right. Okay, any further questions? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, same. Okay. Thank you. Very good. City manager reports. Yes, and um, again. I, I'd like to go back to an item, if you don't mind, uh, and, and I'm sorry. It depends. What is the, well, it? it's the Citizens Communication with the Building Standards Committee's order to demolish the house on Julia Street. Right. Uh, Ms. Vasquez requested to speak to you guys because um, the, she, they ran out of the timeline on um, stopping the demolition. And so we're, we've got the demo order. We're scheduled to demo that. So... She was supposed to come before you tonight to see if you were willing to stay that demo. And um, I hate to just gloss over it. Uh, we can either uh, continue to stay the demo and, and see if we can put her back on for a future meeting, if that's council's wish. Um, but we've got a, a demo contract ready to go. I would I would suggest that maybe staff, or if you are able to contact her, unless there was some compelling reason she wasn't here, because she's missed multiple meetings, ignored multiple notices. They tear off the notices off the house and throw them away. I mean, come on, you know. But I, I agree that if there was an emergency or some reason they couldn't get here, then I don't mind. We can bring it back in January. Mayor, I'll make contact with her attorney. She recently hired a, a lawyer out of Corpus Christi, uh -huh. and I'll, I'll see if there was a compelling reason why they were not able to be here. Yeah, I mean, I'm, that'd thank, be fine. Thank you for letting me go back to that. I just want yeah, clarification for staff. Good point. So uh, not to do it quickly, but I'll do it quickly uh, because I don't want to make light of it, but we have three awards that we're receiving from the finance department, and Wesley's here, and I'm not sure if any of the other staff is, but 
We have the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting, the Government Finance Officers Association Distinguished Budget Presentation Award, and the Achievement of Excellence in Procurement. The financial reporting, this is our 36th year. The budget presentation is 30 years. Those two go hand in hand with our transparency of letting the public know how we uh, do budget process. And then the procurement award is relatively new. That was started several years ago with our processes and our policies. And so um, it's important that we get those recognitions, but I also think it's very important that the public understands about those recognitions. And uh, our staff does a really good job on uh, following those procedures for those awards. And uh, they're to be honored. And so my run rushing through it is uh, should not be interpreted as it's not important. And what Wesley is here. Um, but Gilbert's on vacation, so, but Wesley, thank you. Carry our thanks back to the finance staff and the purchasing department staff for all the hard work you do. Thank you. Agreed. Did you bring them with you? Hold one of them up for us. I know they're plaques. Obelisk. Obelisk? Obelisk? Okay. Yeah, this is the procurement award. Uh, it's like a Washington Monument. The other two are plaques. So they just give us uh, little coins now that we attach to it, so it's the same one each year. And one of them we've gotten, you said 36 years? 36 That's years. Older than, longer than West, older than Wesley, probably, <laughs> I think. <laughs> That's, yeah, probably even the 30-year war, so anyway. Well, you're, you're right. part you of a good... a good tradition set. Yeah. Right, right. You're part of a good team there. We're glad you're there, too, so thank you. Well-deserved. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay. Is there any further business? No, sir. Okay. Merry Christmas, everyone, and we're adjourned. Thank you.